Hello, BookTube. I have another BookTube event that I want to talk to you about. Believe it or not, well, it's all we've been talking about is, well, March events is all that we've been talking about because March is extra top heavy with BookTube events. They're all great. And I only, I've only talked about, I think, about half of the ones that I know are out there. Uh, you can't do them all. I don't think you can do them all unless you devoted your reading entirely to BookTube. And I can't do that. <laughs> I will not do that. I read new releases. Uh, but there's another event coming out in April, hosted by two of my favorite booktubers, Roz at Scally Dandling About the Books and Elizabeth at Book Henson Books. This is, I think, the second year of people in April, which, had I been involved with the planning of this event, would, of course, be called April. <laughs> It is coming up in April. It's the whole month of April, and it's this, it's dedicated to life writing of any kind, any kind at all. So memoirs, of course, biographies, uh, biographical vignettes, biographical treatments, even so far the, as auto fiction. Uh, just that, just life writing. And of those of you who have watched my channel for any length of time will know that biographies are my favorite kind of reading. I love them. Absolutely love them. Now, uh, Roz and Elizabeth have all the bells and whistles, too. They have uh, a Discord group where you can go and talk about all kinds of biography. And once again, this is yet another little nudge, a little, a little encouragement to me to get back onto Discord. All of the BookTube March events have Discords to them. And that it sounds like a lot of fun. Whenever anybody talks about their experiences on Discord, those experiences are completely different from my own. My own were awful. Maybe, almost certainly, that is the fault of my own experiences. So I will probably get back to Discord. If, if it means that I can get into groups like There's No Place Like Rome or uh, March Mystery Madness or People... Uh, and talk to people about these things. The more book talk I have in my life, the better. So if, if it means that, then I will I will try to do it. I will be having uh, tech help <laughs> next week, and that is on the list to, to somehow acclimatize me to to uh, to Discord. Uh, they also have uh, Ros and Elizabeth also have uh, prompts. Very vague prompts, prompts that are perfectly open-ended to give you whatever kind of shape you want to the thing. And they also have a read-along, a group read, which I imagine would be very much facilitated by Discord. And the group read that was chosen is I Am, I Am, I Am by Maggie O'Farrell, uh, which is a, a strange, uh, undeniably eloquent book. I... I had my reservations about it when I read it, but I read it a couple of years ago. This is going to be a perfect opportunity to me, for me to go at it again. But I believe that I Am, I Am, I Am will be the only non-new release that I will be reading for people in April. For people. <laughs> because, like I said, I read new releases. That's the bailiwick that I've set for myself. New releases in the American book market in the 15 or 16 genres that interest me. No genre interests me more than biography. By a weird flip coin, and no splinter genre interests me less than memoir. Memoir has been so completely adulterated in the 21st century in, into that whatever elements of it were not already pure, repellent narcissism have gone away. Now it's all just pure, repellent narcissism. And also, identity politics run amok, and identity politics run into the realm of gaslighting. So in the 21st century, you come downstairs, you have had a bad two-hour session of mindless scrolling on Instagram, you're not feeling all that happy about the world, you walk around the kitchen island to where your, your mother is working on a big jigsaw puzzle. Her pride and joy, she's got probably a hundred pieces left, and she's in the final slalom of it. And as you're walking around the kitchen island, you pull the biggest of the sharp-bladed uh, state knives from the little the little wooden holder and you plunge it into her about a thousand times you don't hate her you were talking to her just the other day you just had a bad scrolling session and you know you, you're you're full of 21st century fashionable anomie so you don't care one or one way or another what you do uh and as soon as you're done with that before you even wait for the police to show up and if you're in america riddle you with gunfire you write a memoir <laughs> and in that memoir the very first thing you say in fact it's the title is i did not kill my mother 
<laughs> so it's not only rampant, curdled narcissism, but it's complete gaslighting. <laughs> so, and that's all that memoir has become in the 21st century. So, but, but nevertheless, it is covered by people. <laughs> and, and it's a weak spot of mine. I don't particularly tend to like it. So maybe that means I should read more of it. Certainly, you'll never be in better company uh, for any of this stuff. So what I thought I would do, I don't know if, if Ross or Elizabeth have made TBRs yet of their own. There's still some time left. There's time left for you to get a copy of I Am, I Am, I Am by Maggie O'Farrell. Uh, you should definitely do that and give it a try. Uh, let me know if you need an ebook. Uh, but there's also time for you to figure out what you might be reading. I'm not actually clear off the top of my head now that I think about it. Maybe I should have researched before how many booktube events there are in April. Uh... Our Rome event will still be continuing. Of course, Classics and Company will still be continuing. But what about book, booktube events that are dedicated to April? I don't know, but this is a fun one. And you only have to read one life or life treatment of any kind to qualify. But I thought I would do a TBR for this video, now that I've told you about the event, to show you some of the things that I will certainly be reading. This is a case, like so many other booktube events, where my own TBR is dictated to a large degree by what the publishing world will do. I'm going, I want to read most of the new releases in the big genres that I love. So I will be reading all the books that I'm going to be showing. I don't think there are any here that I have already read. Uh, but I will be reading them all, for good or ill. And there's quite a bit of ill here. Of course, that's an element to my TBRs when it comes to new releases that isn't necessarily reflected in the TBRs of people who use some other yardstick, some other metric, have some other bailiwick that they want to cover, uh, which is that because I read new releases, I will get a lot of books, I will read a lot of books that don't really intrigue me at the beginning. I've been surprised pleasantly by that a lot of times. And also, a lot of it is preset. I don't want there to be a major biography that I simply don't read, that I miss. Other booktubers face that kind of trouble. I mean, if you're a booktube channel that's entirely devoted to murder mystery or, let's say, epic fantasy, well, then you're going to read the new the new releases in those genres, whether they're good or not. Uh, that's sort of the boat that I'm in. Uh, so who knows how how good any of these things will be? Let's go. Let's go all the way to the beginning. I know how good some of these things are, but we'll go all the beginning and uh, go through them just so you can see what my TBR is for people in April. People. <laughs> And the first one is uh, an actor's memoir. And this is always tricky because I know it's not fashionable to say, uh, but actors are really, really stupid. <laughs> they are, you, are, you are not hiring them for their piercing intellect. I know nobody likes that. Nobody likes to hear that. Uh, but they can't even say hello to you at the door if there isn't a cue card above the lintel. <laughs> they are really, really dumb. So when they reflect... I mean, there are rare examples. There are rare exceptions where that, but but usually not. And the kind of actor who is most often thought by viewers, by moviegoers or stagegoers, as being extra intelligent are Shakespearean actors, naturally, since they're saying the greatest words ever written in any language in the human race. And yet, <laughs> and yet, no, and yet, no, it is not true. Shakespearean actors are just as dumb as all other actors. So our first book, <laughs> it's going to be, it's going to be some light stepping on my part. Uh, this is Shakespeare, The Man Who Pays the Rent by Judy Dench. Uh, <laughs> I revere Judy Dench. As a craftsman on the stage. I revere her as an actor. She is incredible. In anything. In anything. She is incredible. And by all accounts, she is warm and funny in person. Not quite as disposed to losing her clothing in public gatherings as, as, uh, as someone else I could name, but, but still uh, warm and funny. Uh, and so I imagine this will be a memoir of her of her many, many Shakespeare roles. She's been playing Shakespeare on the stage in front of her door and crowd since her teenage years. That's that's well over half a century. There may be insults here, insights here. It may be. <laughs> there are... It's Helen Mirren, 
<laughs> I, I just realized that I'm going to be driving you all crazy. It's Helen Mirren who likes to take her clothes off. But as far as I know, Judy Dench does not. But it, the problem here, I don't know if it will be a problem. The potential problem is that a, a setting like this, a premise like this for a book, might tempt Dame Judy to write about Shakespeare, <laughs> which she is no more able to do than my little schnauzer is able to do it. You're getting needlepoint, Frida. Here you go. She's right here. She's right next to me on the bed. But, uh, hi, baby. What you doing? She's a little restive. It's a little cloudy. So uh, we haven't been getting the exercise that we want. The sun will come. Bright, glorious spring sunlight will come. We will spend hours outside. Uh, so that's the first one, is the Shakespeare, the man who pays the rent. Then this next one you would think would infuriate me, but I bet it won't. I bet it won't. This is by Tommy Tomlinson, and it's called Dogland, in which he, uh, without, so to speak, a dog in the race, explores the world of professional dog shows. And the people, and the dogs, uh, who, who go through them. Uh, the, the organizing question in the publicity material for this is, are the dogs happy? Now, I've been to my share of, of dog shows. Right there in the pit, right there in the run with the, with the handlers and the owners, not in the crowd. And I can say beyond a shadow of a doubt that the dogs are mostly happy. The ones who aren't happy are the ones who wouldn't be happy anyway. <laughs> they wouldn't be happy if they were if they were on a bed surrounded by edible treats. Uh, the, the dogs that I have met here are happy, but they're awful regimented. They're they're happy, but they're I would say less than your happy-go-lucky, scruffy dog who would never be at a dog show and who's sprawled next to you on the couch right now. I would say they're less happy than those dogs, but maybe that's unfair. Maybe that's it's just vocabulary for happiness that's lacking here because what I encountered in the dog shows that I went to was the same thing that I encountered when I would ever, when I would meet Iditarod dogs, sled dogs. They were happy. They were glowing with happiness, but it was a very regimented kind of happiness. It was a task-oriented kind of happiness that I, myself, don't associate with dogs in the fullness of their happiness. Uh, but nevertheless, a lot in this book will depend on Tommy Tomlinson's writing. I don't think I know this author. I don't think I've ever read anything by this author. A lot will depend on the writing here, because I already know the world. The secrets that he's going to be uncovering, I already know. Uh, but it should be a lot of fun. Uh, and it, it counts as a memoir. I think it counts as a memoir, because he's in it. He's in it a lot himself, and it'll also be a lot of profiles of the dogs and the owners. Uh, then we have uh, a full-scale biography. I don't know if this is coming out in America. I still don't know that. I didn't know this the last time I mentioned this thing. I still don't know. This author does not have American representation, I don't think. Uh, so maybe this book won't come out, but I am too curious now. I've read too many reviews of this thing. I'm too curious not to get it. I'll just pull strings. I'll get somebody to send me a copy, even if I buy one. I could, still, I could go to Blackwell's and buy one. This is by Nicholas Shakespeare. This is not the last time a Shakespeare is going to appear on this list. And this is his biography of Ian Fleming. This, the hilarious subtitle. I think that's on the UK edition. I don't know if the American version will look like this or call or be called like this if it gets one. Ian Fleming has sold millions more copies of his books in America than he has in the UK. So it's entirely possible that this might get a US publication. Uh, and maybe they'll scrap the subtitle. They certainly should, because Ian Fleming was not a complete man at all. This might be a complete biography. But Ian Fleming was a, a damaged, warped, hunched-over guy. That, that's, I wouldn't call him a complete man in any way. Uh, but fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. So, uh, this... I think I saw the listing for this. I think the publisher... Uh, some publisher sent me a listing for this for April. So I don't know if that's the UK edition and someone was just being extra ambitious or if this actually is. I'm going to read it either way in April. Uh, then this next one is by Jennifer Baum. This is uh, a memoir. It's a memoir of hers. This is a memoir that I think will pull a lot of strings for me. I think it will I think it will tug at my heartstrings a lot. I, I think that it's probably a memoir of a city, of New York City, at a time when I knew it very well. Uh, it's called Just City. And it's a memoir of growing up on the Upper West Side when the Upper West Side was nothing like it is today. Those of you who don't know your American history, your contemporary American history, those of you who don't know New York except as a place in books and, and movies, never been there. Uh, New York was once wild, and it had dreams. It was a ragged place. 
uh, a dangerous place at times, certainly at times of night, but also in certain locations of the day. But full of dreams, full of hopes, uh, full of not only entrepreneurial visions, of course, I don't know, none of you will know the name Crazy Eddie, but there were, uh, there were uh, wild entrepreneurs sp uh, springing up on every corner, but also civic dreams. How can we make this the just city? How can we make this a better place? We will build towering housing developments where people can live for affordable prices in the heart of the greatest city in the world. Uh, those tenements, you see one on this cover, I'm almost certain that's where Jennifer Bond grew up. Uh, those tenements still exist. When you take the train or the bus or drive into New York City, you can see them. They don't look inviting anymore. But once upon a time, believe it or not, that was the picture of a dream. Where all of us will live together. Where we'll all live together, we'll all work together, we'll all somehow get along together on the subway, and we'll all recreate together in Central Park. That dream died. And it was one man who killed it. Largely one man who killed it. There was a mayor in New York City called Mayor Bloomberg. This is insider baseball to people who don't know, don't live in America. You're not going to know any of this. But he changed the city. Completely. He changed the city in a way that when I was watching it happening, I definitely recognized it. But I didn't recognize it from America. I recognized it from Renaissance Italy. He changed the city in the way the Medici did. And you might think, well, okay, that's Botticelli, that's Donatello, that's Leonardo da Vinci, that's Michelangelo, surely that's not a bad way. Okay, sure. I didn't, it's, I didn't say there were no positives. But the only way that you can do that is by wiping out this, by wiping out these dreams. You can't have anything sloppy in your New York City. If you're going to make it into a new kind of city, variety's going to have to go. Uh, parity, socioeconomic parity is going to have to go. You're going to have to make it into a playground for the rich. Um, and Mayor Bloomberg set about doing that. Now, before he took office, if you were at Lower Manhattan, uh, where the World Trade Centers used to stand, if you were in some dive bar in Lower Manhattan uh, or a cheap restaurant in Lower Manhattan when they existed, uh, or used bookstores, dozens and dozens and dozens, hundreds of them, if you were there and night fell, and you had to get all the way to the top of the island, you were in serious danger of your life. You would, If you tried to walk that distance, or even a chunk of it, to Midtown, you would almost certainly be assaulted. Uh, mugged was the, old, was the old word. You practically have to Google what mugging means now. It was absolutely endemic to the city. I myself was mugged in New York City. Not successfully, but the attempt was made. <laughs> it was absolutely, everyone had a story like that. That was, that kind of messiness was what you got that went hand in hand with this kind of dream. And now, in Mayor Bloomberg's New York, you could not only be at one end of Manhattan at, I don't know, 9.30, 10 at night, maybe, maybe a, a, a movie gets out, maybe a little later that an opera gets out. You could not only be there, but you could be absolutely tanked to the gills, helpless, practically waving your wallet around. And you could walk in your bare feet from wherever you were, all the way up to the other end of the island without anyone even bothering you. In fact, more likely than not, in Bloomberg's New York, someone would swing by in a car and say, you know, can I help you? <laughs> can I help you at all? <laughs> okay, so you get that. But at the cost of... No one can live in New York City anymore. No ordinary people can't live in New York City anymore. And the Upper West Side? Good Lord. It's practically synonymous. The Upper East Side and the Upper West Side are practically synonymous with eye-watering wealth. So this memoir is going to be, again, it will, everything will depend. I'm not giving it a pass. Everything will depend on the writing talent of the author. But it's going to remind me of a New York City that I knew much better than I know the New York City of today. Uh, so, and that's coming out in April. So that, oh, okay, here's the, here's the other Shakespeare. It's not Nicholas Shakespeare, it's some other Shakespeare. <laughs> this is uh, The Life of William Shakespeare. This is by Nicholas Rowe. I have a little paperback of this thing, but I, I forget the name of the publisher, but some publisher's coming out with a new edition of it, a standalone edition of Nicholas Rowe's biography of William Shakespeare. It has an introduction by Charles Nichol, who did a great book on William Shakespeare called The Lodger. Uh, and this is old. Nicholas Rowe's biography is, is old. It's well over a century old. And it is absolutely foundational to Shakespeare. You really, you really can't get away from this little thing. It's like 60 pages long. You can't get away from it in Shakespeare Lives. 
most Shakespeare biographies that come out are basically just expanding on Nicholas Rowe. Which makes it all the more ironic that so much of what's in Nicholas Rowe is not founded on fact at all. <laughs> it's just, it's, Nickel is really good in his introduction. I believe the little paperback that I have came with a Shakespeare set. Uh, this is published separately. The one that I have doesn't have a price on it. It wasn't published separately. It came in a set of other things. This is the first separately published standalone version of that that I think has existed. I think somebody just thought, you know, th that little book, we could sell that. And that's true. This is a very good edition of Nicholas Rowe's Life of Shakespeare. And if you're interested in Shakespeare, especially if you're interested in Shakespeare biography, well, it pretty much all starts and stops here. Uh, documents here and there, fugitive little interpretations here and there, but the stuff that Roe is giving you is pretty much all. Uh, it will be fascinating to read this again. I've read Nicholas Roe's Life of William Shakespeare many times. I've written about it many times, but I, I, it'll be fun to read it again, and it'll be fun to have it in whatever format this publisher is using. I don't actually know what that format will be. I haven't seen this yet. Uh, but like I mentioned, for this people TBR, uh, you don't know what you're going to get. When you have a venue that is a, a bailiwick that's sort of set for you, you I'm going to read every new biography and memoir that I can get in April. I love it. I love the kind of it, even when I find the subject off-putting or annoying or irritating. Which brings us to our next book. <laughs> this is an author. This would be an author read. Caleb Carr is the author, and he's terrific. He's absolutely terrific. I love him. I love his work. So I'm not going to miss it. I'm not going to miss it if he writes a new book. Uh, even when his new book is a memoir of someone I am not going to like. Uh, this is his new book. It is called My Beloved Monster, and it's about someone named Masha, who is very abusive to him and emotionally aloof. Ringing any bells? Any of you people out there that have Satan's little minions running around your house? Have you, have you compared the new scars from your little minion attacking you, savagely trying to kill you? How many workplaces have I been in when people, cat people, would meet each other in the morning and say, Oh, I've got a fresh one. And they were happy and proud about it. These savage little monsters that they have in their houses. Well, I guess Caleb Carr has one because he's actually calling this creature a monster in the title of the book. This will be a cat memoir. I have read many of them. They definitely count for people in April. I, I guess we would have to allow that cats are people. <laughs> I would read this anyway. This it, Masha could be a caterpillar. I would still read it for the author, but it, it isn't going to be easy. <laughs> okay, all right. Well, we'll we'll stick with the not easy part. Uh, this is this is a memoir called "Never Say You've Had a Lucky Life, Especially If You've Had a Lucky Life," and this is by Joseph Epstein. This is also coming out in April. And really, what would a memoir reading month be if I weren't going to read 300 pages of Joseph Epstein lying his face off? <laughs> it, would be, it would hardly feel like a memoir month at all. <sighs> there is a way in which I would actually rather read about Masha, the demon cat, than I would read this book. But I will read it anyway. It's a new thing. It's going to get reviewed. That's almost goes without saying, considering the author. That's It's going to get reviewed. So... I will read it. Uh, I won't particularly enjoy it. I'm pretty sure I won't particularly enjoy it. And probably on every page I'll be saying, why would you say that? I'm one person, but there are four other people who can directly contradict the fact claims of that story that you just gave. Why would you say those fact claims? If there are people living who can contradict them. Uh, and then as long as we're on subjects that are, that are unpalatable, but there's a new book, people are going to write about it. I want to read it. Uh, this is by Susan Page, and this is The Rule Breaker, a new biography of Barbara Walters. Uh, at, at long, long last, after two and a half centuries of stopping myself, I now get to say the late Barbara Walters. Uh, this is a, a biography of a woman who showed a lot of grit, a lot of courage. The, the, the Name rule breaker it doesn't even begin to cover the territory. That is absolutely true for Barbara Walters. And it took a toll. And w even without the toll, she wouldn't have been able to succeed at doing all of that if she weren't a particular kind of person. That's not the kind of person you want to be trapped in an elevator with. I'd be interested... The main thing that will interest me about this book, I, I don't think it will change my mind about Barbara Walters. I, I really don't think that will happen. But... The main thing I'll be interested in is how much of the world of newsmen 
of the 50s and 60s, Susan Page actually covers. How much of, of Barbara Walters' world is she going to bring in? That's, of course, an active question in any biography. It's entirely possible for you to write a biography of a major figure and barely touch on their world, either intentionally because you don't want to do the extra legwork, or accidentally because you think ju just by telling their life story, you are telling the story of their world. That's almost never true. I would be fascinated to see. Uh, that's the main thing I'll be reading this for, is to see how much of that world Susan Page uncovers. Then we have uh, James Patterson. It wouldn't be a month without a James Patterson book. This is co-written by Matt Eversman. And this is nonfiction. This is uh, something I, he's... I don't think he's ever done anything like this before. I don't think he's ever co-done anything like this before. And it's right up my alley. This is called The Secret Lives of Booksellers and Librarians. And it's a collection of profiles. It definitely works for people. It's a collection of profiles of people whose lives are books, whose whole life is books. I don't think any book critics are in here or book editors are in here, thankfully. Uh, but booksellers and librarians telling their stories to James Patterson. I want to know the story behind this book. I want to know the stories in this book. I will, I'm hoping this isn't the final cover, but I definitely want to just absorb this. I was a bookseller for a long time, 25 years. So I've never been a librarian. Uh, but I, I've been a bookseller for a long time, and I've known a lot of librarians. I have friends who are bi librarians for my sins. Uh, I'm going to love these stories. But I would also very much like to know the story behind this book. I don't think it'll be in here. What I wouldn't give for Patterson to write, you know, write, write a 30-page article. Or, yeah, a 30-page article. Or, okay, if not 30 pages, then six pages. Write a six-page article about the genesis of this book. What legwork was involved? I imagine on Matt Everson's part, not on your part, but write it, write that a six page article and sell it to the Smithsonian magazine or something like, or the Atlantic. They'll take it in a heartbeat. They'll take it. I would like to read the story behind how these stories were assembled, but I, the books are going to be wonderful anyway. Uh, okay. Then we have an author named Patrick Gagney, uh, or, Maybe Patricia Gagney. I don't, I'm not 100% sure I've got the title right here. Well, the title I've got right. Uh, this is going to be another book that's going to annoy me, uh, definitely, because it's going to be not only navel-gazing, but also the aforementioned gaslighting. Uh, this comes out in April. This is Sociopath, a memoir. All of the publicity material that I have heard from this book leads me to believe that not only is it going to be the author's own approach to being a sociopath, but also the author gaslighting you and saying, sociopaths are just people. You should have them on your work staff. You shouldn't discriminate against them. There ought to be legislation to force you not to discriminate against them. Are you are you anti-sociopath? You should be pro-sociopath. Uh, I have a feeling that this book, at least in part, is going to indulge in that kind of gaslighting. We are only two book seasons, maybe three away, from someone doing this about psychopaths. If you don't, don't know the difference between the two, just look up. Just Google, what's the difference between a sociopath and a psychopath? You know a sociopath. Almost certainly you do. Almost certainly. And especially if you live in America, where there is no health infrastructure. So sociopaths are, are not treated, and they are just allowed to go around in the world. You know a sociopath. Almost certainly you do. You don't know a psychopath. But I guarantee you that within the next three or four book seasons, we will have a book like this trying to gaslight you that psychopaths are also a misunderstood slice of the demographic. Sociopaths are not misunderstood. They've been understood for a great deal of time. They are extremely dangerous people. They should be isolated and medicated. I'm not saying exterminated or even discriminated against. But you cannot, you cannot say, well... Our nonprofit has a board and it's got seven chairs. Okay, so if we break it down by social demographic, that means that six of those seven chairs should be women, of course, because, you know, 90% of the world is women. But then of those women, of those six women, I don't know, five, maybe five and a half should be gay because, of course, you know, 95% of the world is gay. They, they can't, only one person anywhere on that on that board can be white. All, we have, have all sorts of others. That, well, someone has to be disabled. Sorry, differently abled. Someone has to be on the spectrum, or all of us do, on the spectrum. And on and on and on. The progressive stack, in other words, it will rule that boardroom. But we cannot get to the point where the progressive stack includes sociopaths and psychopaths. We cannot do that. <laughs> and yet, I get the impression that's what this book is going to do. We'll see. I could be wrong. I'm going only off publicity material. The book itself will be a new thing. And once again, the book itself... The key here will be the execution. 
it could even be possible that this book is trying to gaslight you and me, saying we are unjustly cruel to sociopaths, we shouldn't consider them dangerous, uh, we shouldn't ostracize them, we shouldn't consider that there's anything wrong with them. <laughs> the book might even go that far. It could still be really good. Even with a totally gaslighting, unpalatable premise, it could still be really good if it's done well. The execution is everything. So, so I will report back. Uh, then we have something, I think we've seen this on this channel before. This is Stephen Puglio, who's wonderful. He's a wonderful, popular historian. And this is his new book, The Great Abolitionist, a biography of Charles Sumner. Uh, I can't get over that cover illustration, but I don't need to. It's, it, it, it will attract attention. And Sumner is a great figure. Don't know what the angle will be here. Uh, I worry about the, I haven't read this yet. I worry about the angle. That, because it's the 21st century, so Puglio might have had to take an angle with his agent. He might have had to get use an angle to get this in the door. The most likely angle I can think of, Charles Sumner, for those of you who, you know, don't, are not, again, not up on your American history, was a, a very forceful abolitionist. He fought against slavery. But he was a white man. So <laughs> that presents problems in the intensely racist 21st century. I don't know. I'm hoping that Puglio just tells his story, which is an entirely admirable one. But it may be that he had that he sold this book with an angle. Uh, that would be tricky. <laughs> then, then uh, we're gonna let's finish up here. This has gone on long enough. Let's finish up with another memoir. This is only scratches the surface. I bet there'll be 50 more books for April that fall under the heading of people in April. Uh, but this is. An extremely well-known author. I don't think you'll have any trouble recognizing Doris Kearns Goodwin. This is her new book. Uh, an unfinished love story. This is a memoir about the 60s, about the 1960s. Uh, I imagine that it will that it will spill over into childhood before that and also into adulthood after that. Uh, so I'll be curious to know how, how much this book hews to its own focus. But I'll read anything this author writes she is she is just terrific so I, I i look forward to this i i usually am not pleased uh by memoirs just in general but also by memoirs written by people who are really really good in some other genre and, and doris kearns godwin is really really good in the genre of popular history but i, I would read it anyway there's no chance i was going to miss this so i'll get it and i'll report back uh I will never write a memoir about the 60s myself, but, but I can read somebody else's. Uh, and there you go. That was just, that's just a few. Those are the ones that were at the top of my feed in terms of uh, publicists sniffing around to see who's interested and in what's going to be out there, what possibilities there are. Uh, as a TBR for People in April. People! <laughs> I am not a co-host for People in April, but I will probably in April do a lot of talking about biography because it's a book tube event about biography. It is true. We have, uh, uh, I think Elizabeth pointed out, that we, we do have nonfiction November. We do have a nonfiction event, a huge nonfiction event, but we don't have many nonfiction events. In book tube, we can always take another one, a biography centered one. How wonderful. True, it doesn't have the perfect title. But almost. <laughs> so let me know if you're interested in reading anything for people in April. I'd also love to know uh, how many of you have actually read the group read, I Am, I Am, I Am, by Maggie O'Farrell, in which she documents, uh, documents maybe in air quotes, <laughs> just a bit. Uh, I, won't, I won't go so far as to use the natural South Boston Irish colloquialism of I know her people. I won't go so far as to say that, but it wouldn't surprise me at all if some of the stories in her book were a little bit on the uh, the colorful side. <laughs> but her book is a chronicle of, of uh, many near-death experiences that she's had, and maybe I shouldn't be doubtful, because I've had plenty of near-death experiences, so it's possible that you rack them up. Uh, but I'd be curious to know how many of you have read that book or are interested in it. Some of you maybe read Hamnet, and her her novel Hamnet, and maybe that intrigued you. That's the group read. I'm going to try and join along. I'm going to try to have to be reintroduced to Discord, which I will use not only for this but for everything else. And maybe I'll set up one of my own. Uh, that'll be next week. If that happens at all, it'll happen next week. But I couldn't let people in April go by without a TBR. So there you go. That's some of the things that I'll be reading. Some of the life studies, the life writing that I'll be doing in April. Let me know if you plan on joining. And I will try to remember to leave links to the two announcement videos so that you can see much better booktubers than I talk about this event. Uh, but anyway, I'm going to wrap this up for now, uh, but I'll be back. Thank you, booktubers.